Our speaker today is James Newman, who's subject leader for film, media, and creative computing at Spa Bath University. Bath Spa University. Yeah. I knew I would get something it's wrong. Something, yeah. uh, he just guest lectured for a class that I'm teaching, and I was standing up here introducing him while he was whispering, prompting me in the back with all of this information. <laughs> I thought I would get it this time, but I'm not a good learn learner. Okay, James, take it away. Um, just to explain why I'm here. So um, I'm working on the EPSRC. That's the Economic, Political, Social Research Council project. Um, part of their Sustainable Societies Network, coming over here to look at game preservation. So I'm working with Henry uh, and the folk working on the Cabernetti Collection <coughs> uh, to think about, hopefully that's going to say game preservation, brilliant, um, to think about um, you know, what we might do to provide materials for future his, you know, historians of games, but also game developers as well. So the thing that uh, this project's really interested in is thinking about how we provide materials so that future generations of developers, you know, students, for example, might have historical reference points that they can you know, play with and, and study. Um, so I'm not a preservation practitioner. I'm not a um, museum person. I'm not a librarian, but I work with some of those folk. I'm a, I, I write about games uh, in, what's in what's become called game studies. But I do have some proximity to those kind of folks. So a few years ago in the UK, we founded the National Video Game Archive, which is a, a project with the Science Museum over in the UK. And in a distressingly short amount of time, um, March 2015, which is making me think maybe I'll just stay here and pretend it isn't happening, <laughs> we're about to open the National Video Game Arcade in Nottingham, um, which is... Um, this here, it's about 33,000 square feet of um, exhibition gallery space full of, well, <laughs> I can talk to you afterwards what, what it's full of. Hopefully it's full of exciting things. At the moment it's full of people smashing walls down and building exhibitions. Um, so to say, um, part of what I'm here for is thinking about game preservation, um, but I'm not going to talk about game preservation too much today because I know Henry did that uh, a few weeks ago in his video. Um, uh, is available and I've watched it too and he very kindly mentions right at the end of his talk um, some work that I did which again is coming at this from a video game studies perspective uh, and thinking about some of the implications um, for, uh, for game preservation. Um, one of the ideas that that book I suppose tries to, tries to forward apart from being quite pessimistic about the possibilities of uh, you know, <laughs> any, anything ever existing in the future um, is not necessarily a shift away from game preservation, but just, just some thoughts about um, the dominant strategy for game preservation, which is thinking about play being the kind of outcome, I suppose. We need to preserve games so we can play them in the future. And that being the way that we tend to, tend to approach this problem. So you want to you know, take the code, you want to emulate it, because in the year 3000, when everyone's wearing silver suits and you know, arriving to work on a monorail, you want to be able to play um, Super Mario Brothers, right? Because that's the important thing. Games need to be played to be understood. And one of the things that this book sort of talks about, I suppose, is the, the need to, maybe alongside that, also document what play is. Because play is so important that it can't just be, from my perspective, can't just be the outcome of preservation. So it's not just about saving games so that somebody else can play them. But actually, because play is so important in bringing games to life, in, in turning them into something and, and you know, bringing them into existence, um, the play has to be part of the object of preservation as well, so you should be documenting as much game play uh, as we can. And so, to some extent, that's what really what I want to talk about. So, not how we, not the, not the debates beyond that, because you know, I think Henry talks about that quite a bit. Um, but I'm kind of interested in the idea of what play is, because there's quite a few people here who have talked about games, um, and what we haven't, I suppose, talked about is what you know, recognise that uh, you know those, those games are played by players. Uh, in often very different and so quite sometimes sort of self-consciously different different ways. So this work actually refers to a previous book. I, this isn't all like an advert for stuff, and it's <laughs> it's a shame in a way that this isn't done just before Christmas. But if anyone's still got some <laughs> unused Amazon vouchers, there's a, here's some gift ideas for you. Um, so this book covers a range of different things, and you can see some cosplayers there, and you know this there's. Yeah, discussion of cakes and earring makers and all sorts of other things and the sort of cultures of gameplay. But um, the, the part of this that I want to, um, I suppose, kind of draw on today is the idea of super play. So um, this is a form of play. Um, we'll talk about what play is a little bit and ways of playing games, but there's, I guess, towards the end of this, uh, this talk, really getting to, um, as you can see there, some, some forms of play, some practices that are specifically designed to... Uh, explore the edges of what games are capable of doing, sometimes to the point of breaking them, sometimes beyond, um, which is interesting. So we're kind of interested in things like, you know, things going wrong. Now this 
Does anybody here recognise this? I need to get a sense of the room. <laughs> yeah, OK, so the three people I imagined would. Um, <laughs> So this isn't a screenshot that's been mocked up, and you can see Mario. And we're going to spend a bit of time talking about Mario, partly because it's been mentioned in previous talks here. Um, so it you know, creates the illusion that I am. You know, there's a continuity to this that I was going to talk about Mario anyway, but I can make it seem like it really belongs here because it was talked about last week. Um, this isn't a fabricated screenshot. This is part of a. This is a glitch that we'll talk about a little bit later. So I'm interested in things going wrong. Um, things go wrong in games quite a bit. Um, you know, things go wrong in life quite a bit, as the projector wouldn't come out of the ceiling. You could see the light lighting up, but the projector wouldn't drop down. So we're kind of interested in things going wrong. Oh dear, look. Things like that. And sometimes when things go wrong, it's quite irritating, right? But sometimes when things go wrong, it's really exciting, and that's exactly what the, the pleasure is sometimes located in exploring those moments where the game can... Uh, quite break necessarily, but you can get it into a state where it's doing something that maybe it wasn't designed to do. Um, we might come back to this. Uh, I'm gonna, I was going to ask if anybody knows this, but there's three people here who will tell us what it is. I'll tell you a little bit about it later. So interest in play and the idea of you know, performance. And I guess the reason for that is, so as I come to this, thinking about ga what games are, so f for me, if you're looking for the sort of textuality of games, so how you go about studying games, what's the thing you study? So it's some kind of interaction between you know, the source code and the performance. It's, it's, it's brought into life, and that's where the game is. And so part of what I'm interested in is thinking about what does it actually mean you know, to play a video game? We talk about this as if you, know, you, you play Mario, and we think of it as being some sort of homogenous experience. There's lots of different ways of playing that game, lots of different playings, possibly like an infinite variation of playings, really. Um, so that's what we're going really to sort of drill down into today, the ways in which games can be played, but also played with. So, Mario. I won't insult anybody's intelligence by asking you, uh, or insult anybody's nerdiness by asking you if you know what this is. This is uh, the original Super Mario Brothers game, running on the Nintendo Entertainment System, released in the uh, mid-80s. So rather than just play through the game, what I'm going to show you is some maps. These are fan-made maps. So they don't exactly show you um, what the game would look like, but they give us a chance to see the entire space of the world. So they're quite neat, neat things. Um, the little sort of object, see the coin above the uh, question mark here and the, uh, the toadstool that's just about to appear there, that's not how they appear in the game. This is the way a fan has put this map together to show you all the you know, the, the secret, sometimes secret, sometimes hidden items that would be, that would be available. So as Mario comes along, you jump and hit that, uh, hit that question mark block with your head, and then that's the, the coin that would appear. So it's already this map is revealing something about you know, the hidden um, opportunities that exist within the, um, within the game. Um, through the medium of uh, PowerPoint transitions, we're going to play through this level. So you start to, it doesn't show Mario, but you can imagine Mario jumping along. And already we start, oh, there's a hole there. You could fall down that straight away, and then you could die, and you could lose another level at the next one. And there's all these other objects here. And you jump along, I think there's another, oh, look, another opportunity to die. And then finally, up here, and jump and get the flagpole. Now, depending on where you hit the flagpole, you get a different amount of points. You might even set the fireworks off if you do it really brilliantly. There's also a timer that will be telling you how quickly you completed the level. So already, we've got, um, we've got a sense here that you know, playing a level, level 1-1, one, one, this is the first level you encounter in Super Mario Brothers, iconic game, there's lots of different ways, lots of different performances that are, that are possible there. In fact, it is perfectly possible never to get to see the castle here. You could spend your, enti your entire experience of Mario, you could be picking up the controller and continually falling down that first hole over and over again to the point where you think, I don't see what the fuss is about, and that's it, you move it on. Or... You could be a master, expert player, playing through this game, breezing through every part of that level, not even thinking about the fact that there are objects, you know, this little turtley things that are trying to kill you. You just jump on those as if they weren't there. And this is already interesting. We've got different, you know, different versions of uh, different versions of the game that are being played out. Some that are characterised by nothing but frustration. Some with almost a sort of contemptuous. Um, you know, disregard for the game. It's so easy. How could this? This is almost an insult to my playing abilities. The other thing is, though, let's go back, zoom all the way back to the uh, beginning of the level. So one of the things that was talked about last week, actually, and it's one of the things that games get uh, praised for quite a bit, this game is very good at teaching you how to play it. Right? So you get, uh, you'd start off on the left-hand side. It is very difficult to avoid that mushroom. Toadstool, mushroom, mushroom, I think. Um, 
Toadstool's the character, Mushroom. So you would jump on that, and it's actually you have to sort of avoid that thing you know, colliding with you, at which point you turn from Little Mario into Super Mario, and the game has revealed one of its you know, key mechanics straight away. Um, and the arrangement of the, you know, the arrangement of the objects on screen makes that makes that difficult for that that that, that sort of tutorial effectively not to, not not to happen in front of you. And so for this reason, games are often talked about, and you know, we talked about last week as being really good uh, tools for teaching. They teach you how to play. Yeah, they teach you how to play themselves. They are their own tutorial in one sense. Um, and there's lots of really interesting work on games and education, which I'm not going to go into here. But um, the the other thing about games, though is that they're also really, really bad at showing you what they can do. So this level here that we've got, OK, so it's great. It tells you, you can, you know, you've got to start running. There's coins to collect. There's mushrooms to collect. It's telling you how to play. It's encouraging you. There's a question mark. I wonder what would happen if I, how do I, how do I even get to, maybe if I jump on top of it, oh, no, jumping on top of it doesn't do anything. Oh, look, if I hit it from below, something pops out, and I can collect it. So games are tutorials. Brilliant. They teach you how to play them. Apart from the fact that they also hide things, too. So, turns out there's a whole other bit of Mario that nobody, uh, nobody knew existed, maybe. So if we scroll along again, we'll see, oh look, there's a, there's a pipe there we can go down. And there's this whole subterranean part of the level that was hidden. And we'd pop out here, and then we can jump up the, uh, come to the overland again, and we can jump and hit the, uh, hit the flagpole again. So if we go back, we would come down here, come down this little pipe, and we fall into this little coin palace. We can collect all these coins. And then we move all the way through this uh, pipe here. And we come up to the surface. Now, the important thing is here, oh, and we carry on running. Brilliant. And we finish the level. Now, the important thing is here, I've zoomed around backwards and forwards in the level. You can't do that in the game. The game um, scrolls in one direction only. And as soon as you move, you can't go, you, know, you, you reveal the next sort of screen full of, uh, of the game world, and you can't scroll the game back again. So once you've moved through this level, whether it's above or whether you've taken that route below, you have you know, explored that territory, and there's no opportunity to go back. You can die and restart and make a different decision, or you can play the whole game again differently. Um, but it's already telling us that no single playing of this game can reveal everything in one go. You have to go back and replay it. Um, you also have to know those things are there. Hello. You also have to know those things are there in the first place. So there's a lot of skill, there's lots of knowledge, and there's lots of you know, prowess in terms of execution. You can still know those things are there and not be able to perform them. You can still know I have to jump over that hole and keep falling down it. So the performance, the, you know, the production of that game um, is you know, hugely reliant on the player. So we say you know, play is important to game studies, and we need to recognize you know, the centrality of play and how important it is to be able to document that. But we should also ask then, I think, so whose play are we talking about? Right, because is it yours? Is it mine? Is it the developer? Is it a ludologist? Is it a narratologist? Is it an expert player? So all these different playings turn the game into something different. Now, this is a really, really simple example as well. So let's fast forward a little bit to a different game. OK, so this is a little bit harder, but not much. What game is this? It's Super Mario Bros. 3. And what level is it, Eric? It's <laughs> not the first one. That is correct, but that is, you know, 1-3, one, one in fact. So this is one of the early levels in Super Mario Bros. 3. So one of the sequels to the uh, original game we saw. And again, let's have a bit of a playthrough of this, of this level. So we start off on the left-hand side. You would see Mario. You would be Mario. And you have to jump around. There's some new block designs here with little musical notes that do different things. And a route through it might be to a place like this. And there's still plenty of opportunities for us to fall down holes. And we might still never get this far. But I guess most people with enough lives probably would. And we jump through the star. And that's the end of the level. Fantastic. We're on to 1-4. But, once again, there is more to this than meets the eye. So, you probably saw a little cluster of uh, gold bricks there. So by picking up a shell, you know, killing one of the enemies, grabbing their shell, we can then have it bounce around in this sort of collection of gold bricks and reveal here what was a hidden musical note. These little arrows on here have been placed here. This is part of the, the map making. Uh, they don't feature within the game. If you jump on that, oh look, you fly up here. 
to a cloud level that you can't get to any other way. You can't access this space any other way, and you can run around, catch these coins. If you've got the little raccoon tail, then you can fly up and get this extra life. Then you come back down the pipe, like this. Sorry if this is making anybody seasick, by the way. Um, and then you finish. So another, another hidden secret that you have to know about, but you could probably reveal that from playing it. Eventually, you might sort of, you know, almost randomly, you could sort of throw that shell around and it might reveal that thing. That's still not all. So let's run through this again. So we're running around being Mario, and now we're getting pretty confident. We know what we're doing now. We don't have to worry too much about falling down those holes and dying. And that's, uh, did anybody notice anything as that flew past that time anymore? Let's go back a little bit. Uh, there's an arrow there. That is, uh, that's telling us something. Now, what do we have to do here, I wonder? So again, the arrow's not there. This is now just reminding us. So let's have a little bit of video to see. What you have to do, something odd about that block, that white block, you duck down for five seconds and you fall behind the scenery, look. You actually sort of stepped out of or behind the world. And this takes us to a room that you can't, again, access in any other way to get one of these little whistles that uh, the magic toadstool is going to give us. And as you can see, that will then let us... Oh, it stopped before, uh, it, stopped before it said, you can now get to world 4.1. So you've missed out a whole bunch of other worlds. You don't have to do the next level, world 2, world 3, and all the four levels that they have. Now, there's something about that play that I think you wouldn't necessarily just come to. Um, the throwing shells around, the going down pipes, you could maybe find that out almost by accident. You could just explore the world. Would you think to duck down? Ducking isn't even really a thing. that you, It's not even part of the mechanic of Mario, really. It's a jumping game. It's a platform game. So would you think to stand there and hold down on the controller for five seconds and then drop behind the scenery, like out of the game? There's no other point in the game where you go behind the scenery. So how do you find this stuff out? Right, this isn't just about being an expert gamer. So this information circulates uh, in a variety of different ways, and it's tradable. I mean, in this case, literally, you, know, you can charge money for it. This is a, a US magazine called Tips and Tricks, as you can see. It's unusual in that it was almost exclusively dedicated to, um, well, it's not just a clever title, almost exclusively dedicated to, you know, I'm not going to use the word cheat, because there's a whole other discussion about you know, the negotiation of what constitutes cheating here. Um, but revealing these hidden secrets in games, the things that have been placed there by developers and designers for uh, players to either reveal or to you know, explore once, uh, once the information is given, is given to them. So to some extent, there's, a, there's this important sort of you know, meta-game that's happening as well, where developers are maybe drip-feeding information to journalists who then publish that. Um, and then that sort of word of mouth also spreads that around. Did you know there's this bit in Mario where you can get these whistles and you can, you, know, you can travel around the map and you can get to the end of the game without having to play that many levels at all? And the Mario series, like lots of games, are full of these kinds of secrets. They're called Easter eggs, um, as in the Easter egg hunt. You know, there's little, little nuggets of information that are buried in the game. Here's another really good one, and we'll see this in a couple of places. Look. So you think, so you think look, the level is bounded by you know, the information at the top and the, um, you know, and this, the, uh, the kind of ceiling of these tunnels. But again, you get to jump out of the world. Um, so would you think to do that? Maybe you might try that. You might find that out by accident, and then you carry on running, and you get to these warp zones. So the warp zones tell you that you can then start to tra traverse the map of Mario. There are eight worlds, each with four levels. You can start to traverse the entire game and get to a point where you've completed it by playing very little of it. Which starts to then tell us, okay, so what, what is the object of playing this game then? So is the object of playing this game to see everything it possibly has, to go to every level, find every hidden area, travel down every pipe, fly off every musical block, go into the clouds, go behind the scenery, or is it to get to the end of the game as quickly as possible? Because these warp zones take you, you know, get to world 4.1 now. We haven't had to do any of the rest of the game. Um, and there's another warp uh, zone later on that will take us to the very final world. So we get to a point where we started, the game is almost encouraging us to explore these kinds of things and play it in different, in different ways with different objectives. So this might be a question aimed at, uh, there's certainly three of the people in here I'd like to know the answer to this, their answer to this question. Has anybody completed the original Super Mario Brothers here? How long did it take you? 
most of your childhood. So I probably phrased that question slightly wrong. What I mean is a single sitting, because this is a game also that you, in its original state, at least you can't save. So you can't save it and then come back to it a little bit later. So a single performance from turning the console on, your winning run, how long do you think it takes from like, you know, starting to getting to the end? So I asked this question of some of the students the other day, and they said about six hours was the... Six hours? So there's a whole other question there about whether that's six hours well spent, but we'll park that for another talk. So I think it is, but... Um, one answer to that question is 4 minutes 57 seconds, 693 milliseconds, which is, as you can see, the current world record. Set just seven months ago, in fact. Um, this is at the top. What we're looking at here is what's called, and if you look on the top left there, it says any percent. So this means that you can run through the game um, by using all those warp zones. There's, a, there's an option there that I could have clicked on in the middle that says warpless. It takes you about 19 minutes or so to complete the game using, you know, seeing every level, so every world 1, 2, 3, 4, right up to world 8.4. But even so, 20 minutes is like, that's a, that's a, that's a fairly uh, competent playthrough. Um, but here, yeah, we've reduced the game down to four minutes, under five minutes. This is a practice that's called speed running. Right, so this is taking the game, and the game sort of encourages you to do this. It's got a timer. It's saying, don't, don't dawdle around here. In the first game, at least, you can't scroll backwards. You're constantly pushed forwards. There are these warp zones. You can jump out of the screen. You can, in later games, fall behind the scenery. You know, it's baked into the game that there's some advantage to getting to the end quicker or with less effort, maybe, than you might ordinarily uh, expend. Uh, so this is called speed running. And again, some of the techniques here, like knowing where the warp zones are, is communicated through you know, commercial publications. And there is a huge market today for strategy guides. So publishers like Prima or Brady Games um, will um, work in collaboration with developers, usually, during the development to create a glossy strategy guide, which they can, you, know, you can also buy, often at a sort of bundled discount price with the game. Almost like saying to you, this game is quite hard, isn't it? Um, <laughs> You're not going to finish it. You need some help. Or, if you've taken the pessimistic view that I did in the, that Best Before book, this is a way of basically saying, right, you have now used up all this game. Right? So you tick your way through all the things that it can do so that you can trade it in and buy a new one, because that's the most important thing. So there's that kind of world that tells you, OK, so this is warp zones. Duck for five seconds on this block, and you'll fall behind the screen. And that's telling you what the game has been designed to do. There's another kind of knowledge that circulates as well, another place that it circulates. And this is through fan-produced walkthroughs or game guides or FAQs, as they're sometimes called. Um, so these are things produced by players, not in consultation with the developers. This is entirely based on you know, looking at the surface properties of the game, how the game plays, and deducing from it you know, what it's capable of doing. So this is... This is what I would call it. This is like a sort of form of reverse engineering through play. You try and work out what the game is capable of doing by, by exploring every possible opportunity, every banging every wall to see, all oh, this wall isn't actually real, I can walk through it and there was, a, there was a secret behind it. And looking at gameplay and trying to work out what the interactions between certain choices might be, you know, uh, talking to every non-playable character and writing down and documenting every possible you know, line of dialogue from the dialogue tree. So these are pretty extensive things. Of the, uh, of the guides that are currently on there's a site called GameFAQs, which is one of them, probably the more famous repository for, this, for these fan-made uh, walkthroughs. At the moment, the walkthroughs range between, the shortest one is about 5,000 words, the longest and most extensive one for Super Mario Brothers runs in at about 50,000 words. Now, this is a lot to say about Mario, um, evidently. Um, these are also meticulously, you know, not just meticulously researched, they're also meticulously referenced as well. I often show these things to my students as well, because this is what I want them to do. Right, beautifully laid out. Every contribution from every community member, no matter how small, this little trick that this you know, guy over here has found is beautifully referenced at the end of the document. So they do things like you know, talk you through all the, all the levels. They're, print they're always presented in ASCII plain text as well. They look like code. I think there's something quite important about that as well. This is reducing the game down to its system. I think that, that illusion there isn't, you know, that isn't fanciful. Um, the search mechanism, you can see down the right hand side, this is quite a common thing as well. So if you want to go to a particular level, obviously it gets mentioned quite a bit. Um, so there's usually a code system there, a numbering system in this case. So you can just search for it in this you know, 50,000 words of, uh, of document. So, yeah, you reduce the game down to its system almost, the, you know, the, the, the system that, that, actually, you know, that runs the thing. This is like looking beyond the, the, uh, the audio visual presentation. 
And you get nice little bits of ASCII art showing you the levels and talking about you know, what you might do. And sometimes it's tempting, I think, to look at these and just think, this is just telling you how to play the game. This is, and, and, and often, you know, one use case for these is you get stuck and you think, I can't get any further, I don't know what's happening, and you turn to this to help you out, to get you through the next stage. And clearly there is a use case for that, and part of what's been written here is to aid you get beyond that bit that's too difficult. What is the weak point in this, you know, this creature that I need to defeat, or what combination of things must I use to defeat this you know, end-of-level uh, boss, whatever it might be. That's one possible use for them, and one part of, the, one part of this walkthrough is to describe what you do, almost like travel writing. So it's like, well, it's like a, a bit like a sort of pirate's treasure map. You, know, you take two paces forwards, and then you dodge to the right, and then you take three paces forwards. So there's an element of that about them. Where they become interesting is where they start to document other things, things that maybe an official strategy guide wouldn't because the official strategy guide doesn't necessarily want to draw attention to the fact that the game has a bunch of bugs and glitches in it that can be exploited. Or possibly because the people writing the strategy guide and developing the game don't know that there's a bunch of bugs and glitches that can be exploited. Now for you, this is, uh, this is our you know, walkthrough of Super Mario Brothers, the first title that we looked at. And there's a thing here that says, Warp Zone to World Minus One, The Minus World. Has anybody here heard of The Minus World? The same three. Oh, there's a new no. A new hand has gone up. Um, right, the minus world. So this is part of uh, part of the original Super Mario Brothers. So, typically, we think of Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers, having eight worlds with four levels in each world, and they're all beautifully documented in those fan guides. They're all beautifully documented in maps, and you can buy official Nintendo magazines that will tell you everything about them. You can read interviews with developers talking about them. You can read academics who have studied them in enormous detail, talking about the layout of levels and the design of characters and the design of environments. This is all fine. The Minus World doesn't get talked about very much outside of player cultures. It turns out you would look at the Minus World all the time. It was the background to the slides. So, so let's go to the Minus World. We'll go there first, and I'll tell you how to get there afterwards. Because how to get there is probably more interesting than what it is. So, it is a, here's a map, and in the time on a tradition of scrolling through PowerPoint slides, let's run through it. It is an underwater level. There are other underwater levels in Mario. This isn't how I sped it up a bit. So you would then swim through. All these maps would be populated with little horrible monsters, little sort of jellyfish type thing, called bloopers, I think. Um, all the other maps you've seen will be populated with creatures that are also trying to, uh, trying to bring you to your demise. Um, so you swim through this level. And you go through the pipe, which is what happens in Mario, right? You go through a pipe and you expect to come out maybe on the surface, climb up one of those little uh, staircase things and jump and find a flagpole. What happens? Oh, you get put back in the beginning and you get dropped back into the water and then you swim through again. So you think, okay, this is very familiar, isn't it? Bit lazy of the, uh, of the designer. And then you go back to the So you get the idea, right? So this is a, there is no, you cannot escape from this level. You are stuck in here. The only options are you can fall down one of the holes. All that does is respawn you again. You can wait for the timer to run out and kill you. And really the only option you've got is take the, you know, turn, the, turn the console off, take the cartridge out, chalk it up to experience and say, that was fantastic, I've now been to the minus world, let's never do that again. Right, you, can't, you can't escape it, you can't score any points. You know, it doesn't lead anywhere else. So it's pointless, is it? Come back to whether it's pointless. Let's also, this is where it gets a little bit nerdy, and I'll try and stay out of the nerdiness a little bit, but there are actually more than, there's actually more than one minus world, which again tells us something quite important for game studies, because we sometimes forget that the game we've played, so I'm sitting in my little Elizabethan stable block with my NES in my university, and I forget that this is actually a Japanese game that's been translated, ported over, um, most of the people here, I suspect, probably played Super Mario Brothers on a console that looked a bit like this. It was originally designed for the console that looked rather more like this. The Famicom, family computer. This is the Japanese, the original Japanese version of it. It has slightly different piracy, anti-piracy controls. That means you can do different things with the code, uh, different things with the games as well. Actually, the final US release of the NES, which is a thing called a top loader, if any of you had one of those, they're comparatively rare, actually is much more similar to this. So some of the things you can do with the Japanese version, you can also do with the later US version. 
Um, one of the things you can do with the Japanese version, for example, is take the Mario cartridge out while the system's still going, replace it with a cartridge of a game called Tennis, do some moves in Tennis, put the Mario cartridge back in again, and there's a key combination, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but it involves holding down a couple of buttons, which resumes your Mario game. And your Mario game can be resumed with a bunch of sort of garbagey data that comes from a different game, because there's lots of code sharing in early NES writing. And so some registers that mean something in Mario get written to by tennis, and you can generate a bunch of levels. So the um, Japanese version of the Minus World actually ends up looking quite different. So World Minus One up here, has different, it's a, a sort of palette shift. There's also random princesses. You see that's the, uh, I had a little bit too much time this morning before I got here, so that glitchy thing that I did in PowerPoint just because I could, with some randomly spawning princesses, which are sort of things that happen here. Occasionally a Bowser will drop down. And actually there's three easily accessible minus worlds, which are completable in the Japanese version as well. However, we're getting into the weeds there, so let's go back to thinking about the um, you know, the normal version of the minus, minus world, the one that gets written about the most, at least. So, it doesn't offer that much gameplay opportunity, but to be able to say you've been there is quite, is quite, quite an important achievement. And there's quite a few records online that circulate of, of, it's quite a mythical sort of thing. Nobody really knew if it was real or not. There's people talking about, you know, you see players recounting their, you know, their, the first time they saw it. There's a fantastic account uh, of, uh, it's not uncommon, it's an experience I had personally as well, where somebody, somebody knew how to do it, but they didn't want to tell you how to do it, so they made you look away. And then when you looked back, they were in the minus world, and you think, how did they do that? This person is an expert player. And there is, just with that super play stuff, we have leaderboards, a lot of this is based around a really conspicuous performance, a performance which is designed to be consumed. Right? This is about performing as an expert player, knowing things about this game that other people don't, having been to parts of it that other people haven't, done it quicker, scored more points, whatever it might be. But this isn't play that's, you know, so it's, there's a personal level of achievement, clearly, but this is about presenting yourself as a, you know, performing as a particular kind of player. <coughs> and those systems being formalised, like, you know, with speed runs and world records that, that rank and, you know, display those performances. And we've seen with things like YouTube, so you've probably noticed that YouTube, about half of YouTube is basically people playing Minecraft at you uh, at the moment. And, you know, there's things like Twitch as well, and, and baked into the current generation of consoles, we have, you know, game, t you know, effectively TV stations, and lots of games will immediately upload a, you know, replay of what you just did so that all your friends can see it. So this idea of, you know, not only performing as an expert, but consuming other people's gameplay has become quite a normal, quite a normal thing as well. So you get to the minus world, though. Let's come back to this, because I just noticed we are yeah, approaching the end. The mechanism for getting to the minus world is what's, I think, really interesting about it, because it means exploiting a glitch. Now, this is slightly slowed down. This is a, uh, a GIF version of it. So what happens here is you're running as Mario. This is the point we got to before, where we sort of jumped out of the screen and run across the top, and this is going to be the warp zone here but it's quite important that you can't see all of it. So instead of jumping over the top, out of the level, and running along like you were intended to do, that was the intended secret that was been designed into the game, you can take advantage of some of the shaky collision detection in Mario, um, or you can kid the, uh, kid the game into believing that there's a, uh, you know, a flaw. This is all about you know, hitting at just the right angle. So this, is quite, this is quite well documented online if you do want to try this at home later. Um, you won't get it first time, but you will eventually get it. You can hit, the, uh, hit that pipe at just the right point, and then you can flick the controller the other way to try and kid the system into believing, yes, there really is a floor underneath you. This is a thing that shouldn't really happen, obviously, but you, know, you, can, you can then slide through the wall. But the most important thing is, if you carried on walking here and let the rest of this room come into, into view effectively, what the game does is then loads all the data for those, different, those three different warp pipes and you get taken to the various warps as intended, whatever it is, three, four, and five, four, five, and six. By doing it this way, rather than jumping out of the, you know, out of the frame uh, and running as intended, which forces the data to load, you've, you've actually started to generate this room but the data isn't being populated yet. And so what's happening is a bunch of garbage data gets written here instead. So here, and in actual fact, you can go further than this, but as long as the, basically the rule is as long as the back wall doesn't end up showing, then that garbage data will be, will be loaded. The middle pipe will still take you to, a, to, a, to the destination it was supposed to, but the ones either side will take you to the minus world. 
There's actually quite a few glitches in Mario. Here's a selection of them. There's the one on the right there. The bottom left is what's called a wall jump. So again, it's sort of using the same kind of technique. There's a couple of places where you can jump over the flagpole, you carry on running, and there's just, just I think there, it just carries on forever. And there's a nice little, even though this is a glitch necessarily, but the way the, um, the way that sort of fire stick is rendered means that there's a position you can stand in when there isn't a position where it's rendered that will kill you because it's rendered either side of you. Right, so there's loads and loads of these things, but the, the accessing the minus world is probably the, uh, the most famous, and for our purposes here, maybe the most interesting one. Now, what happens, it's called the minus world, it's actually technically minus, it's world 36-1. So what's actually happening, when that garbage data is loaded, the, um, if you look back at it more carefully, it's not minus 1, it's space minus 1. 36 is a blank tile in Mario, so it shows up as a space. Um, so all this kind of mythology about it being the minus world, world negative one, is actually based on a, you know, a misreading of it. So the, the, the blank tile just blanks out the 36. So if you go back and look at it, the text is actually displaced and it becomes really obvious. You look at it and you think, oh, how, could we have, how could we ever have not, not spotted this? You only spot this, though, because there's a bunch of players who go beyond just finding this glitch and exploiting it and documenting it, but then actually going into the code and mining around and working out what's happening. So working out which registers are being written to, what data is being you know, gathered from where. And this is where you get into players then code, you know, what, they, what they would then describe themselves as code miners. They're looking at what's actually happening within the game as you're playing this stuff. So there's this interaction between players who are exploring, and the game's telling you, explore me, right? I'll do things that you didn't expect to do. You can literally jump out of the frame. So the game is telling you to explore the world. It's filling itself full of secrets. And there are players who are then testing those boundaries, trying every conceivable you know, you know, manoeuvre that the game appears to allow. Then start to find things that the game doesn't seem to allow. And then another bunch of players, maybe the same people, will then start to think, OK, so what's actually happening here? How, how can we then exploit this? How can we understand it? Um, and then interesting, this whole mythology then builds up around it. So there's a whole bunch of stories around, you know, the minus world, about it being a, you know, a leftover, it's a remnant, it's like a debugging area as part of the original development of the game. It was designed and then, you know, taken out, or the game was supposed to have 10 billion worlds in it when it was originally designed, and this is just one of the ones that never got finished. It's not that at all. It is a, it's just generated by the system in, in error, effectively. It's a bunch of garbage data. It could easily just crash the game. It just so happens it loads that that call to World 36.1 actually just loads the data for, I think it's 2.1 or 7.2 or something. It's, like, it's, a, it's an actual level with a different palette set underwater with a bunch of different creatures. So it's not... It's never been designed. So nobody at Nintendo ever sat down and said, let's make this level. So it's never been designed by anybody. It's generated by normal play. It's something you can do in the game. You don't have to hack the ROM or anything. You don't have to do anything. And pro you, know. you can probe around in the code to work out what's happening with it, but it can be performed by anybody with a standard you know, retail version of the game and the, uh, and the console. It's generated by the interaction between the source code and performance. That's exactly what I think a game is. And it's revealed by players. So I think this raises like a, a really interesting question for game studies. Is this part of the game? Right? It wasn't designed by anybody. It wasn't taken out, but it was left, sort of left in, in one sense. Um, it can be revealed. The developers didn't know about it. They then respond to it. Subsequent remakes of this game remove it, but not every release of it afterwards removes it. So versions that run under emulation, so official Nintendo versions of it, they get released to emulate the original ROM. They still have it in. But when it's remade, like with fancy new graphics or there's an arcade version of it, that explicitly removes this. So it has a very sort of ambiguous status within Nintendo's canon as well. And uh, they, there are references to it in other games as well. Often quite oblique references, but kind of in jokes, in manuals, or little bits of dialogue within another game that will refer to it. So it's, you know, it's widely known about. So this is why I think it's important to think about play. This is a, this is a level, this is part of you know, that Mario world, or Super Mario Brothers' world, that can only really be, it only really comes into, into existence through play. So game preservation is one thing, preserving the, you know, preserving the code and being able to play it is one thing, but actually to really know what Super Mario Brothers is or was, you have to, you have to see 
and be told and be shown by these expert players who have explored this and revealed things about it that, you know, as I say, even the developers didn't know were there. Now, I've picked Super Mario. We can pick almost any other game here. Pokemon's another excellent example. Um, at the risk of, I realise I'm being videoed, so I probably won't tell you exactly how glitchy Pokemon is, but it is quite a famously glitchy game. There's loads of things you can do. You can generate these glitch Pokemon that are just garbled bits of graphics with names like Missing No, right? So it's fairly obvious that stands for Missing Number. But if you're a fan who wants to believe there might be 152 Pokemon in here and you've been told that there are some which are really rare, right? you want to believe that, so you develop this whole mythos about it. And you, you make it real and you end up you know, making you know, biscuits in the shape of a missing number and writing 30,000 word treatises on how it, how it could possibly have you know, got into the game and giving it a backstory and a narrative along with everything else. So this is why I think gameplay preservation is really important. We should recognise that we want to document this stuff, see it being played not just be able to play it at some point in the future, because we might not be these people and the game might not reveal itself to us in the way that it, 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 in all the varieties of ways it can be revealed. That, that is the, uh, is the end of what I wanted to talk about. And I think, well, that's, that is as close as I've ever come to finishing on time. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to uh, try and answer them. Um, Thank you very much.